On Friday night, I got to watch as Brooklyn's sister got engaged. She didn't know it, but her now fiancé had set up a camera, and since he'd originally wanted a lot of the family to be a part of that, and that couldn't happen because of social distancing, he, he set up a camera and he hid it in their living room, and then he was planning to play her a song uh, before he asked her to marry him, because when you're young and in love, you do those sort of things. I- I'm just going to tell you, if, if there's anything, if there's anything that has been a positive of all of these social distancing and shutdown from the coronavirus, it is that all of our social media feeds have been spared of the ridiculous prom proposals that have now become the prerequisite for going to prom with somebody. The students who are watching, listen, this is just Uncle Brian talking for a minute. This isn't, this isn't biblical, um, but, but it's very wise. If you find yourself with somebody who, in order to go to prom with you, feels the need for you to rent a helicopter and act like you're a contestant on The Bachelor just to go to prom with you, don't do it. It's not going to work out anyways, and if it does work out, all you're signing up for is a life of, of debt and headaches. So I'm just telling you, run, ask somebody else to go to prom with you. Ladies, if you find yourself in a relationship with a guy who's too scared to ask you to go to prom with him, you call me old-fashioned, you call me whatever you want, but you got to be the one to ask. No, forget that nonsense. Go find yourself a man who's willing to put himself out there and, and willing to, and, you know, that's just free for you students who are watching. So next year when there is a prom, you just tuck that away and remember that. But Tyler was upstairs and Andrew's like, hey, are you ready? Because he gave us all the time to be watching and people were getting restless and it's always fun to watch all the different faces of the video chats and our boys were trying to hijack the chat because they just saw a camera and they were running in front of it and we're grabbing them and being like, no, sit over here. And everybody, of course, had their chats muted and luckily everybody was successful in that and Andrew's sitting down there playing and at one point, Brooks Brothers, like, I think we all just got hijacked into watching a concert of Andrew's uh, that there isn't really going to be an engagement because it was taking forever. And so Andrew finally calls out, Tyler, are you ready to come downstairs? And she's like, I look like a garbage dump. I can't come downstairs. And I'm like, finally, finally, this thing has some redeeming qualities about it. And I start laughing and I just want to start shooting off texts like I'm sure she does look like a garbage dump. And then Brooke takes my phone out of my hand and holds it down. And she finally comes downstairs and sits right out of the shot of the camera, which I just thought was hilarious, uh, just because she didn't know that there was a camera. And so she sat up right where we couldn't see her. And so Andrew's sitting there, and he's singing some sappy love song, declaring all his feelings for her. And then one of, their, one of, one of her dogs jumps up on top of him and starts licking his face, and he's got to push the dog away. And then he gets to the end of the song, and he gets down on one knee, And I'm muted, but I'm like, don't do it, buddy. Don't throw your life away. Don't do it. Don't do it. There's still a chance not to. I'm joking. Marriage is a wonderful thing. Tyler is a wonderful person. I'm sure they'll be very happy together. Andrew, if you're watching, there's still time. Uh, But he got down on a knee, and he just started started telling her how much she meant to him and asked her if she would marry him, and she said yes, and then he let her know that everybody was watching, and there were tears all around, and it was, it was a lovely experience. As, as social distancing has happened, people have had to move a lot of these meaningful experiences uh, to the internet, and so there's engagements, obviously, that are happening online. There are, there are funerals, unfortunately, that are having to take place online because people can't congregate together, and so just an immediate family will get together and they will stream out uh, funerals. A friend of mine participated in one of those this week, um, just, just in trying to keep that connection. Because right now, everything's changed. Engagements have changed. Funerals have changed. Job situations have changed. As you see the, the numbers, it's just staggering how many people are awaking to a new normal as they've been either furloughed or they've just been flat out unemployed and all the shockwaves that are going through there, families that are having to spend a lot of time together in being confined or or discovering new tensions and frustrations and all of that. 
And so families are, are starting to fray and, and some sadly are, are beginning to show the signs of falling apart. And we're seeing all of these, all of these things. And so over the course of the next few weeks, we're, we're going to be doing something called What Now? And basically, we're just going to be looking at what happens when everything changes. What happens when everything changes? When uncertainty becomes the norm and the normal you once knew disappears. That the normal you once knew is no longer. When fear is everywhere and no one seems to know what to do. That's what we're going to be looking at over the course of the next few weeks. And this morning we're going to start by looking at a portion of the book of John. So if you have your phones or your tablets and you're not streaming along there, open up the Bible app and go to John 20, 24. That's where we're going to start looking this morning. But John 20, 19 to 23, right before John 20, 24, records for us Jesus appearing to his disciples after he rose from the dead. He, re- he appears to his disciples who remained, most of them remained together, and he appears to them showing them that he was victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and he did just as he said he would do. And then we pick up the story in John 20, 24, where we read these words. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, one of the twelve disciples, one of the people who followed Jesus for three years from town to town, saw the miraculous, had the most interaction with Jesus, saw some incredible things, walked with him, literally spent three years of his life in ministry with Jesus. That's his background. Think about it. After three years, you think you've seen the end. You and your friends scatter. In that moment, there are threats of arrest. There are threats of being put to death. People are angry. People hate you. You've seen all of these incredible things, but now it's over in your mind. Because the one whom you followed, the one who was going to bring about a kingdom, the one who promised a revolution from God, is dead. And your life is on the line. And so just because Thomas wasn't with the other disciples doesn't mean that Thomas is the only disciple who ran. No, 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 no. They all did. They all ran. The other ten, because Judas Iscariot had gotten the money to betray Jesus, then went out and killed himself. The other ten got together. And they were having dinner. But Thomas wasn't part of that. And one of the realities that we need to understand that we see right here is that everyone handles loss differently. Everyone handles loss differently. For many people, they want to be part of a community. For many people, it's encouraging to be part of something where there's a big gathering. But not everybody's that way. Some people are processors. Some people, it takes more time. Some people are more introverted. Whatever the case may be, All we know of Thomas is that he wasn't with the others. And so when he experienced loss, he handled it differently. And right now, when a lot of people are enduring loss and uncertainty and the unknown, one of the things we have to understand is we have to be gracious to people because people are going to to handle this time differently than you or I may. And I may handle it differently than you do. And that's perfectly okay because God has wired us differently. It doesn't mean that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. What it means is that as we're wired differently, so we're going to grieve differently, we're going to process differently. And here's somebody who just spent three years of his life and he feels it's all for naught. Because Jesus, the one whom he followed, was dead. And maybe right now you're feeling an immense sense of loss because your new normal has been completely upended. Everything you once knew has fallen apart. And uncertainty has taken over in your life. 
We continue in verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. So the other disciples and Thomas meet up and they tell Thomas the good news. They tell him, no, 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 Jesus isn't dead. Jesus is alive. He's, ro- he's risen from the grave. He's proven victorious over death. All is not lost. We have hope. They told their story. And so in the midst of uncertainty, what I want to encourage you to do is not to pretend that you have all the answers because literally no one has the answers. No one knows. No one has the answers. It's perfectly okay for you to say, I don't have the answers and I don't know because nobody does have the answers and no one does know. But here's what you can do. Tell your story. Tell the reason that you have hope. Tell the reason that in the midst of uncertainty, your life isn't in a complete tailspin because of the promise that you have as a follower of Jesus. That all is not lost. And while we may not know what tomorrow brings, we serve a God who does. And so as we just sang, we don't have to be slaves to fear. We don't have to allow the uncertainty to paralyze us. But we can take hope. We can take confidence in the fact that the God we serve is greater than anything that we will ever ever experience or ever face. And so just start with your story. Start with what Jesus has done for you. Start with why you have hope. That's it. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to pretend. Be brutally honest. Be brutally honest about what you're experiencing and what you're facing. Talk about your uncertainties. Admit that you don't, that you don't know everything. Open up about your fears. Don't feel like you have to be some distant person that when people look at you, they're like, there's somebody who's never, never feared anything. They eat nails for breakfast. No, you don't have to be that person. Be authentic, be genuine, be real, and just say, there's a lot of things I don't know. There are a lot of things I'm uncertain about. There are things I wish I had answers to that I simply do not. But let me tell you why my life hasn't completely fallen apart. And share the hope that you have as a result of your relationship with Jesus That's what the disciples did. That's what the other disciples did when they encountered Thomas. They didn't sit down and say, well, here's theologically how we're going to prove to you that Jesus rose from the... No, what they said is, Jesus is alive. We've seen it. We've experienced it. Let's start there. Verse 25 continues. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I will never believe. And here it is, what everybody knows Thomas for, the doubt of Thomas. This is it. This is what we all know him for, doubting Thomas, the disciple who didn't believe The disciple who, when he heard the good news that Jesus was alive, said, until I touch it, until I experience it for myself, I will never believe it. His entire life, his entire legacy, defined by one moment. And maybe that's true of you. Maybe there's something in your past One moment, one act, one thing that completely defines you. It is the thing that just as doubt is is married to Thomas, is married to you. And it seems you can't shake it. I mean, that's true of Thomas. Thomas. The very way that we still know him is as a doubter. 
Never mind the fact that he followed Jesus for three years. That doesn't count. All that counts in our narrative is this, is this moment. That until I put my hands there, until I see it, I won't believe. And I wonder, have have you been defined by something in your life? That if you could, you'd go back and you'd take it away, but you can't. And so now anytime somebody thinks about you or speaks your name, there's the qualifier. There's the qualifier. And truth be told, it's become your legacy. One moment. If that's true of you, do not tune out. Because I promise you, you're going to see this morning that hope is available to you. And that while that moment may be your legacy in some people's eyes, it doesn't have to be in God's. But there he was, and he said, I need to experience it for myself. So verse 26 tells us this. Eight days later, His disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Eight days later. Now, I'm not exactly the most patient person in the world. It's a fault. I am not exactly the most patient person in the world. That may even be a bit of an understatement. I don't know. But I am not the most patient person in the world. There's a quote in my office at home from Winston Churchill that says, I like things to happen, and if they don't happen, I like to make them happen. That, that sums me up pretty well. I do not like to wait on things. I, 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 patience, patience is not one of my strongest points. But for those of you who are wired like me, for those of you who struggle with patience, you're thinking the exact same thing I'm thinking. And these words just jump out of John's account for us when we read them. Eight days later, what are you doing, Jesus? Come on. Here's a follower of yours. He's like, until I see it for myself, until I put my hands in his wounds, until I see Jesus for myself, I won't believe it. And a week and a day go by, and Jesus can't be bothered to show up? Like, come on. What are you doing? Let's go. Eight days. And it's just a beautiful reminder to us, especially those of us who struggle with patience. That God is not dependent upon our timetables. We want him to be. But he isn't. God is not dependent upon our timetables. And sometimes the frustration that we have, we're like, God, why are you not working? Why are you not acting? He actually is. But it's just not fast enough. Eight days later. That just jumps off the page to me. Come on. And so you might find yourself right now in the midst of all this uncertainty saying, God, let's go. Help me figure this out. I don't know how I'm going to provide for my family. I don't know what the next week or month is going to look like. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Do I need to find another job? Can I even find another job right now? How how am I supposed to navigate this? What am I supposed to do? I was supposed to graduate in a month. What am I supposed to do now? Do I go to grad school? Because I'm not going to be able to find a job. What in the world am I going to do? All that uncertainty. I promise you that God cares. And the temptation is going to be, if God doesn't answer those questions on your timetable instead of his, for you to lose heart and to become discouraged and to think that maybe God somehow doesn't care. And I promise you, nothing is further from the truth. But God is not dependent upon our timetable. And I love something else about this too. That eight days later, the disciples are together with Thomas, who just eight days before said, I don't believe you. I know what you just told me. I know what you experienced for yourself. I don't believe it. 
And here we see that that didn't end their relationship. They didn't write him off. They didn't condemn him. They are there in community. Right alongside each other. We talk about it all the time, that the church is a community. And in moments of doubt, in moments of weakness, in moments of despair, then more than ever is when we need to be that community. That we don't push people away and question whether or not their faith, enough, whether or not their faith is strong enough. But those are the very moments that as followers of Jesus, we should hear a rallying cry to be next to them, to walk through life with them, to eat with them. And to carry them. And they're too weak to continue by themselves. That's what we see modeled for us here. And as people who follow Jesus, that's how we need to conduct our lives as well. And verse 26 continues. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They're having a meeting. The room is locked. Jesus magically appears supernaturally and says, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, verse 27 tells us, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Do you hear the message of Jesus? The message of Jesus to the follower that we call Doubting Thomas? The message of Jesus to the one who said, until I experience it for myself, until I put my hand in the wounds of Jesus, until I see it with my own eyes, I will not believe. Jesus shows up and his first message is, peace be with you, because somehow I just broke into this room, freaked you all out, but I'm here. Peace be with you. What's the second message? Come here, Thomas. Come here. Come here and believe. And here we see something incredible about our God. That God is not scared of your doubt. God isn't frightened by it. That the message of Jesus is not one of condemnation. It's not one of were you listening for three years, Thomas? Were you lit three years? Were you listening? All those conversations that we had, all those speaking engagements that I had where, where I told so many people stories of the kingdom of God and what God was going to do, all those private conversations that we had on our journey as disciples, were you listening? That's not the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is, come here. Come here. Your faith might be completely shaken right now. There might be so many thoughts running through your head because there's so much uncertainty. There's so much anxiety. There's so many unknown things. There's so many ways that life has just completely changed. That your faith might be completely shaken right now to a point you don't want to even acknowledge it. But what happens in those moments oftentimes is rather than us take that doubt to God, and just be honest with it. We try to hide it. 
like somehow if it's within us deep enough that God isn't going to know. We're just going to hide it down somewhere that, that God will never find out about it. And it's in that darkness where we try to hide that the distance starts. Because we try to we try to figure it out. We just try to, we don't want to acknowledge it. We try to bury it. We think, I can't really take this to God. But what does Jesus say when he shows up to one who eight days earlier said, You're full of it. I won't believe it unless I touch it for myself, unless I see it for myself. What's the message of Jesus? Here you go, Thomas. Here you go. And we see the incredible heart of God. I want to encourage you, if you're facing doubt today, don't run. Don't hide it. Don't feel like you have to cram it down and throw it in some distant place where you never talk about. I'd encourage you to do just the opposite. I'd encourage you just to offer it to God. Say, God, here it is. Here's my struggle. Here are my thoughts. Here are the areas I'm not so sure about. And what I can promise you, because what we understand of the heart of God from this, that God is more than ready to meet you right in the midst of that doubt and to give you the equivalent of here you go. Come experience it and see it for yourself. And Thomas answered him, My Lord, and my God. Thomas decides who Jesus is to him in that moment. He decides who Jesus is to him in that moment, and you have to make the same decision. You have to make the same decision. Nobody can decide for you. You have a choice to make. You have a decision to make. We've all heard about the doubt of Thomas. In fact, most people call him Doubting Thomas. It was his legacy. But here we see the faith of Thomas. Here we see the faith of Thomas. That in the midst of his doubt, God loved him enough to show up on the scene and say, here you go, Thomas. Here you go. And if we're going to think about the doubt of Thomas, we do ourselves a disservice not to see the faith of Thomas. Because the same offer from God is available to us. That if we would seek after him, he will reveal himself to us. And Jesus said to him, verse 29 says, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who who have not seen and yet have believed. Are you struggling with doubt? Because the same God who opened his arms to Thomas and stretched them out is opening his arms to you today. And saying, come follow me. The thief, the king of this world comes to steal to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you could have life and you could have life that is full, that is overflowing. That's the offer of Jesus. And it's available to you today. And some people say, well, well if God existed, if God was real, then why can't I see him? Why can't I just... Why can't I see him if God is real? 
as though it would be something different than when Jesus appeared. And he was rejected, written off, and crucified. John 20 closes with these two verses. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That life's available to you today. And the arms of Jesus are stretched out to you. Wherever you're watching this from. Right now. God is not scared of your doubts. God is not scared of your hang-ups. God is not frightened by what's holding you back. In fact, he's saying, bring it to me. And let me see it. In the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of the unknown, in the midst of change, we are certain of this. That God loves you. That's the reason for those nail prints in his hands and his feet to begin with. And his love for you is not changed by your inability to comprehend or by your struggle to understand. Your doubt is not bigger than God's love. So stop hiding it. Stop carrying it by yourself. Acknowledge it. Give it to him. And if that means that for the very first time you make the decision to give your life to Jesus, you've just welcomed life like you've never experienced before. God, I pray that we would be people who in the midst of uncertainty remember what we can be certain for. I pray that we wouldn't be people who feel isolated. I pray that we wouldn't be people who feel like we have to walk through life alone. I pray we wouldn't be people who feel like one mistake define our legacy in your eyes. But that you are the same God who showed up to one who said, I won't believe it until I see it and said, here you go. So I pray for the person today who's struggling with doubt. And I pray rather than run that they would lean into it. And they would give it to you. And in a very real and tangible way, you will answer them. I pray for the person who needs to experience life by entering a relationship with you. And I pray, God, that today, right now, they would make the decision to give themselves over to you, to confess their sin to receive what you did on our behalf when you died on the cross for us, rose again three days later, showing that you are God and that we are loved. And I pray that as they make that decision and they experience new life, They'll never look back. They would be eager to tell their story of the hope that we all have because of who you are and what you've done. In your name we pray.